I Hate Politics is a podcast about a human activity we love to hate. I am Sunil Dasgupta. In the mid-1990s, in State College, Pennsylvania, Kate Johnson, Doogie Whittaker, and Mad Salens came together to form a band, which they eventually called Finster, putting together their first album in 1998. Thereafter, as so often happens, the band scattered to regular lives and even to different musical endeavors. During the pandemic, Kate Johnson, a nurse, found herself in forced isolation from her family and went back to songwriting, which, after three years of interstate music production, has led to their second album, 25 years later. Finster is releasing their new album, Crosswinds, full of songs of love and longing on this week's show. And I caught up with singer Kate Johnson, guitar player Doogie Whitaker, and their newest member, Howard Rayback, a bass player and a Washington, D.C. area music producer. We will listen to a lot of the album and talk to band members about, among other things, the political economy of music. Stick around. Baby, those blue eyes, they call to me. Just the rolling around in my mind all day. Lust and desire, temptation and longing. I want you so badly, but I just walk away. Such a sweet mystery I dream of that smooth skin Kiss by the sun We're just dancing around in your windows Dying to lean in But instead I should run Politics is a podcast about our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools and streets, and our local governments as they function in diverse and democratic societies. This means our politics are messy, dirty, sometimes corrupt, with often self-serving politicians. But no matter how much we may hate politics, we are never exempt from it, even when we refuse to participate. In fact, the purpose of politics is to keep society moving precisely when we don't agree with each other, like now. Music for this episode comes from the Interstate Band Finster, with headquarters in the Washington, D.C. area. Kate Johnson on vocals and guitar, Doogie Whitaker on the guitar, Howard Reback on bass, and Mad Zelens on the drums. You 
You're listening to I Hit Politics. I'm Sunil Das Gupta. In the news this week, a brewing conflict over new protected bike lanes that have reduced road space for cars on Old Georgetown Road in Montgomery County. Since 2018, two pedestrians and two bicyclists have died on Old Georgetown after being hit by drivers. Child care provider Donna Sisi Amara Sekara, construction worker Michael O'Connor, and two teenagers on their bikes, Jake Castle and Enzo Alvarenga. The deaths of Castle and Alvarenga brought out large crowds of sympathizers and neighbors. Intense lobbying following Alvarenga's death in particular by local county council member Andrew Friedson and local state house delegate and now majority leader in Annapolis, Mark Corman, led the Maryland State Highway Administration, which owns Old Georgetown Road, to install protected bike lanes along much of the roadway. This took away a driving lane in each direction. After Castle was killed when he fell into the roadway while biking on the sidewalk, Friedson had said that Old Georgetown was a dangerous street and it was only a matter of time that another tragedy might strike. And it did with Alvarenga's death. The Maryland State Highway Administration finally added the bike lanes, sticking white plastic visibility dividers to reserve the rightmost lanes going north and south for non-auto use. The bike lanes have brought a huge backlash in local communities along Old Georgetown Road. First, with the complaint that the way in which the bike lanes were added did not have adequate public input. Second, there have been complaints about lack of signage and increased traffic congestion resulting from the removal of the two car lanes. A change.com petition to remove the bike lanes claims that the road is consistently congested with back-to-back traffic even in the middle of the day in good weather. The petition argues that the bike lanes are the real danger here because now cars are cutting through quiet residential side streets where children play. Pedestrian and bike lane advocates monitoring Google Maps during rush hour retort that the complaints about delays are exaggerated and whether the time saved, often a few minutes, is worth the lives lost to more collisions. The petition to remove the lanes says that a new high school under construction on Old Georgetown Road requires more automobile road space. But of course, this assumes that high school students will travel mainly by car or bus, not by foot or bicycle. More than 6,000 people, though we don't know if they live in the area, have signed on to the petition. More than 6,000 people have signed the petition, though we don't know if all of them live in the area. Certainly, the local next door group is filled with outrage. This kind of face off between the rights of pedestrians and bicyclists versus the rights of the drivers are common and have their roots in how we think about our neighborhoods. The petition to remove describes Old Georgetown Road as a six lane major highway rather than a neighborhood road presumably to be crossed on foot or bicycle. This wasn't always the case. Not too long ago, Old Georgetown used to be a four-lane roadway with wide sidewalks, which were cut down to narrow strips of three feet to make more room for car lanes. Foot and bike traffic became even more self-contained within the neighborhoods along Old Georgetown. The site of the new high school used to be the site of an old middle school, which given traffic on old Georgetown was surely only walkable from neighborhoods 
that directly abutted the school rather than from across it. Many other cities, including Amsterdam and Paris, have gone through similar fights. Growing density requires greater integration of foot and bike traffic rather than impassable rivers of concrete and steel. Who among us who oppose the bike lanes want to look in the eyes of Jake Castle and Enzo Alvarenga's parents and tell them that their son's lives was worth less than the few extra minutes they now spend on Old Georgetown. The ultimate irony is that those who drive are also those who walk and bike. Perhaps a few of those inside of cars on Old Georgetown will choose to ride in those bike lanes. There's always a complaint that bike lanes are not used enough. But that is only the case because few actually know how to use them. It takes time for people to change their lifestyle, to make these adjustments. And if the bike lanes are yanked before, folks adjust to a new life. As the Maryland State Highway Administration did with the bike lanes on University Boulevard in Wheaton across the county, then they didn't run the policy in full measure. Mayor Bowser in Washington, D.C. has released a comeback plan to appeal to folks to return to Center City. The pandemic lockdown demonstrated that something like a third of all work can be done from home. There have been fears that work from home is going to change the very structure of our national economy, reducing by some measures as much as 40% of commute time overall. This would ease pressure on highways, transit systems, including the local Washington Metro, have lost significant ridership and are interested in bringing them back. Equally, there is research that argues that a major shift toward work from home will lead to a resurgence of ex-urban home building as city dwellers move further and further out. Washington, D.C. estimates that roughly 40,000 residents left the district between 2018 and 2022. That's about 5% of D.C.'s population. Of them, 30,000, or about three-fourths, were in the 20 to 34 age range believed to be the core demographic for urban living. Now, Mayor Browser is proposing a goal of 35,000 new jobs and a total population in D.C. of 725,000. D.C.'s 2020 census population number was 670,000, so roughly another 50,000 residents. More narrowly, the plan seeks to add 15,000 residents in downtown D.C., along with 7 million square feet of new residential space. Where will these new residents come from? It is unclear. But the numbers present an interesting comparative story. Between 2010 and 2020 censuses, Washington, D.C. region grew by 800,000 people to 6.4 million. But there were significant differences between its many jurisdictions. Washington, D.C., the district itself, grew among the fastest, but so did Prince William and Loudoun in Virginia and Frederick in Maryland. Among close-in suburbs, Prince George's grew 12%, Montgomery grew by 9%, and Fairfax by 6%. One of the most interesting pieces of data to come out of DC's presentation on this subject was that Maryland vastly, many times over, surpasses Virginia as the destination for out-migration out of Washington, D.C. Why? Virginia is widely believed to be a better place to do business than Maryland. The comparison sharpens even further when we compare Montgomery and Fairfax. 
the two largest jurisdictions in the region. New business start rate in Montgomery is set to be low. Virginia has also made big investments in transportation and railways and is friendlier to housing development. Despite all of this, the choice of Maryland as the bigger, much bigger out-migration destination, presumably two suburban Maryland counties, is telling. Despite all of this, the choice of Maryland as the bigger out-migration destination is telling. Could it be that Maryland remains more affordable in terms of housing? Could it be that Virginia, despite its investments in transportation, including railway, remains a bigger traffic gridlock? Or is this a political choice liberals make going against their own material self-interest? You're listening to I Hate Politics. I am Sunil Dasgupta. I'll be back with the band Finster, which is getting back together. We'll lie in a dust of snow, allow the ground to make a mold. Look to the sky, rise and feel your weight. Can't speak for you, can't talk to you. Sail the light on. Finster, the band, welcome to I Hate Politics. Would you go around the Zoom and uh, say your name and what you play, please? Sure. I'm uh, Kate Servino Johnson. I play uh, guitar. I sing. Uh, I'm a songwriter. Uh, I'm Doogie Whitaker. I'm lead guitar, background vocals, uh, various other instruments that need to be done. And uh, I'm Howard Rayback, a uh, newer bass player, um, producer, mixer, pusher of buttons, and placer of mics. And Matt Zelens is missing today because he has a conflict. Uh, Matt plays the drums. Your new album, Crosswinds, releases today. This is your second album. It comes 25 years after your first album in 1998. What brought you all back together? Well, um, we've all lived in different places. I should start by saying that. So I am down in North Carolina. Um, and Howard, you're in Maryland? Uh, Arling Arlington, Virginia. Arlington, Virginia. And Doogie, you're in uh, Baltimore. Kens Kensington, Maryland. Kensington, Maryland. I know you guys so well. I know where you live exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we were all spread out, um, you know, kind of living our own lives. Doug and I have always kept in touch for a long time. Um, and Howard, I met through this whole process um, when we got back together. Um, but essentially, it was back in 2020. So I um, currently work as an ICU nurse um, at a teaching hospital down here in North Carolina. So um, it was 2020 and the pandemic hit. And then our unit that I work on started taking COVID positive patients. Um, and this was back when like no one knew what was happening and like COVID was big and scary and people were dying all over the place. Um, so my mother uh, lives with us right now in my house. So she's got her own apartment downstairs. Um, she went to go live with my aunt um, and so the safest thing that I figured that I could do during this time was to go downstairs into her apartment and live separately from my husband and my two kids while I was taking care of COVID patients. So I stayed down there by myself for 10 weeks um, during that time. So
So as you can imagine, it gets pretty lonely when you're by yourself uh, for that period of time. I would see my family kind of from afar. We would like go out in the yard and talk from a distance, but um, I didn't really get to spend a lot of time with them then. Um, so for me, turning back to music was a big comfort for me. Um, so I had my guitar down there and I just started writing songs and working out old songs that I had uh, written a couple of years ago as well. Um, and then Diggy and I got back into contact during that time. And um, it just kind of came that maybe we wanted to collaborate on something together. And we were deciding whether we wanted just to try to do the two of us or if we wanted to try to maybe do it as a like revive Finster again. And ultimately we ended up reviving Finster with this. When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? what she said to me Can you What will be will be I heard the sort of rough demos of the songs and they were moving. Um, they were relatable, at least from my point of view. Um, and but in a really simple, direct way. Your first album from 1998, Wish I Had a Camera, was much more about teenage angst. But this time it's more sincerely about love. Let's listen to I Like the Fact. And I like the fact that when you walk, you don't swing a thing, you don't cock a gawk. I like the fact that when you move, you don't try to dance, you just shake it down loose. When you speak, you tell me the truth with a little wink I like the fact that when you lie I see the truth by the glint in your eye I like the fact, I like the fact, I like I like the fact, I like the fact, I like I like the fact, I like the fact, I like I like the fact, I like the fact, I like The fact that when you sleep, you store up a storm, you tangle the sheets. I like the fact that when you wake, you're ready to move, you're ready to shake. You're really living in different places, and I think I think Kate made a point of this. And so, how are you recording together? What's going? I mean, what is the mechanism <laughs> here? Uh, magic, El elfin magic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'll I'll jump in. So I think as as we talked about earlier, um, uh, to start this project, um, Doogie had this idea about uh, renting uh, as, and this is like mid mid pandemic, uh, twenty twenty. I'm assuming I'm, and he talked about um, getting a, a small house up in Pennsylvania and going up there and just like recording a whole bunch of tracks, and with. But I felt also at the time with COVID going on and I have I have uh, two teenagers at home and I'm like, uh, I think that many people in a small space, I'm going to I'm going to bow out of this one, but I'll provide you with all the stuff. So at that house, which they sort of nicknamed Big White, um, which I understand was like a it was a snowstorm. Cabin. There was, was a, a snowstorm. Storm. OK, so it was like a fishing cabin of some sort. Yeah. In any event, um, uh, they recorded some basic rhythm tracks uh, and some basic vocals to start. Um, and then they brought those back. They, so they set up to try to get most or all of the drums recorded for all the songs we had planned on. Um, and to at least get, um, even if they weren't tracks, we're going to keep a, like a scratch guitar or sort of a, a guitar to kind of hold the rhythm and the, and the melody in place, um, vocals as well, just to sort of build the structure of the songs. So at least we had the drum tracks and then we could have all the instruments play to those tracks so that it felt like everybody was in the same space. 
Um, so yeah, so they got those, most of that, I think we probably got about five, four or five songs of drums um, and basic guitar and basic vocals done, uh, brought those all back. We kind of went through to figure out what we had and yeah. And then everything else was done remotely. I did, um, you know, I did all the bass here in the studio because it was great. I could do that on my own time and nobody had to know it took me 45 takes to get to a certain track or comp it together. Um, <laughs> that's just my little secret. Of course, it was all first takes and they were all brilliant. Um, and then uh, every once in a while, since we're not too far from each other, Doogie would come down here to the studio and we'd lay down additional guitar tracks or acoustic tracks or vocals or whatever. And um, and then if we needed to redo some vocals, you know, I would send uh, Kate the demo or the, at least the rough of what we were working on and she would record a vocal and send it to us. And so, yeah, it was a lot of digital snapshots going back and forth. Like the rest of the world, I watched Get Back um, in 2022. And uh, Kate and Doogie, I wanted to ask you whether it was natural for you to get back uh, together after this long break. Um, or did you feel like, who the heck is this person? You know you are now uh, going to be stuck in a fishing cabin together trying to make an album. So uh, what was that like? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. Um, I will say, um, I will say it was really surprising and gratifying that the first time me, Matt and Kate put our instruments on, we played through one of the new songs in the album from start to finish without, we just did it. And, wow. um, so that felt great. That, that felt really good that we knew that we could, that the three of us were professional enough that we could walk into a room and do that. Um, but that's one thing about this band is that the players have always been professional, whichever lineup we've been, we've had, cause we've had various people in the band. Um, it's always been a professional, you know, as far as the musicianship goes, we come in prepared. Um, not like the Beatles. Not like the Beatles. No, no, not like at all. Hackers. Those hacks. <laughs> yeah. God. Um, Kate, you want to say anything about that? I mean. No, I felt like we picked up right where we left off. Isn't that We're amazing? Like, yeah, we was like peas and carrots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it felt natural. It just, it was the same energy. We're just a little grayer. <laughs> yeah. In that spirit, let's listen to Like a Champ. It doesn't matter when the lights are paper thin Through the blinds of my room Oh, there's a quiet roar from the neighbor's door Time for things to go wrong I retreat back home But there are problems still With no resolutions near But I don't see them when I
just amazing. I mean, because to me, you know, you live through 20 years, 22 years or whatever, and then suddenly, you know, you just pick up your instrument and you're as, as if you never left, which is kind of really, truly um, incredible. I will say from my from my point of view, like the thing is, is that even though I had been in some bands before I met Kate and before this all started, I would say my biggest musical growth happened in those years. Um, I really learned how to be a guitar player and to be part of a band playing with Kate and Matt and Sky at the time. And um, I still, I still cite um, some, some advice that Matt gave me as far as uh, there's one time where he, he, wouldn't let me leave the practice room until he taught me how to play on the beat, push the beat and play behind the beat. And that half an hour of, of lesson probably advanced me years in my playing. So it's so because Finster was such an integral part of my evolution, it feels very natural to play with Kate and play with Matt and, and, you know, it's very easy to fall into this because it was such a big part of, you know, of that evolution of my, of my, you know, my musical journey. I want to talk a little bit about the fact that Matt is not here, right? Because he couldn't join us. He has a conflict, you know, work, life, whatever it is. And, you know, all, everybody, all of you have work life issues that sort of impinge on your musician, uh, Shep Howard is the only one that actually makes a living out of music. Um, the rest, the others do not. How do you balance, you know, the different parts of your life? So many musicians now are in this position that you are in, right? That you are making music, you're not being able to live off it, but you feel driven to make it. And so how do you balance that? I, I think there's almost a relief in not having to make a living off of it for me personally, because I feel like to me, it's such a joy to go to as an escapism that to not have to worry about a paycheck from it, I think for me is beneficial. So that's kind of how so it I is a it. hobby for you. I, I, don't, I don't know that I would call it a hobby. I think it's a, like, it's a part of who I am. I don't necessarily mm -hmm. consider that a hobby, but it's what I do, but it's not what I make money off of. Is that fairly common uh, among musicians? To play music? <laughs> no, to to or feel to... like it's a relief not to have <laughs> to depend on a paycheck from royalties or whatever. I guess the only thing I could say, I could say to that is, um, um, and speaking about having, having met and worked with other bands who, tour and do do all that kind of thing um because there's no yeah i mean there's no money in royalty anymore there's no money in publishing since streaming has happened the only way to make money at, at what all the bands tell me is it's tnt touring and t-shirts it's getting out there making money off ticket sales making money off merchandise and hope you can you know maybe if you can get a a, a song or two placed in a commercial or in a tv series or something that'll pay for so many more months of being able to write the next record or something it's really tough for, for me um, because I don't rely on performing as a musician or putting out music as my sole source of income. Um, it's, I guess it's a little different for me, but anybody I find working in the arts, whether they're my age in their fifties or if they're younger or older, you have to do 19 different things and cobble together if you want to work in the arts. And I come from an arts background, I should say, too. Before I was an ICU nurse, I worked in um, arts um, administration um, and worked in nonprofits. It's a really hard life. I love the arts, but I don't necessarily want to make a living off the arts so that I can enjoy it and so I can give back to the community. I think the arts in general are just taken for granted a lot of times. And this is the this is what musicians face all the time. It's just like Barr saying, you know, this is an unpaid, you know, have you come in you're not going to make any money except for what you can get in tips and stuff like that but they're making bank at the bar and it's just it's a cycle that's gone on for a very long time um that being said you know like 
if you get into if you're getting into music from the ground thinking you're going to become a millionaire you're getting into it for the wrong reason it's not gonna the the vast majority of musicians don't make money we do it because we love it because we can't not do it basically um, i if i couldn't play guitar i don't know what i would do like it would it would literally affect me um i don't expect to ever you know make any substantial money from from my music uh if it happens that would be great but i'm not i'm not counting on it um and the people that do like i i do i have you know um i have certain friends that do that are professional touring musicians that that's all they do they hustle so hard I mean, it is insane how much hustle they have to they have to have, and how much they have to plug themselves, and just to break even, just just to be able to keep going, to make it to the next gig, and it's ridiculous and it's really depressing in a lot of ways. Um, but ultimately, anybody that, you know, I, I feel that if you're in music, it's because because it's part of your soul. It's not because of a paycheck. What is your favorite song in the album now? Do you want to go first? <laughs> no, I'm going to ask you to choose between your children, I guess. <laughs> uh, that's a good that's that's a really good question. Um it has changed over the last three years. Um, but I will say my favorite song on the album right now is Hot Headed Lovers. I think that Kate's lyrics for that song are some of the best lyrics I've ever heard, had. And I like the chorus to that song. I, I, I put up there with like some of my favorite lines ever, which Richard Thompson is one of them. Uh, what is, I'm paraphrasing here, red hair and black leather favorite color scheme. Oh yeah. Yeah. Vincent 52. Right, right, right. Yeah. Red hair and black leather. My favorite color scheme. same arguments play over again we're hot-headed lovers stubborn with pride pinned in the corners with no place to hide i'm so tired i don't want a new home i just want to rest in your warm tender home you're still the boy who stole my What is your favorite song from the album? Um, I would have to say my favorite song right now, because like probably everyone, it kind of changes as we work on stuff too. But I think Don't Walk Away has been one of my favorites. It's, um, it's, it's, kinda, it's a simple song, but it's this beautiful and kind of cinematic song as well. So it's kind of small, but big at the same time. And it's just really lovely and luscious and just really a beautiful, beautiful song that um, I think everyone's parts just came together so beautifully.
Well, I'll tell you, my kids listened to the music and they said fire. So, wow. How old are yeah. your kids? 17 and 14. Okay. Then and we're 11. In. <laughs> I hope the album takes off and, you know, really soars. Um, please come back when you have more music and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sunil. We we'll appreciate it. Don't walk away. Don't walk away. That is the band Finster getting back together for their second album, Crosswinds, 25 years after their first. Kate Johnson on vocals and guitar, Doogie Whittaker on guitar, Howard Rayback on bass, and Matt Zelens on drums. You can find them on your favorite streaming service. At I Hate Politics, we cover... Politics and society, of course, but we also love, love music, which has always been for me a tremendous escape hatch, as I imagine it is for many of you. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone else who might want to, please email us at ihppod at gmail.com or reach out on Twitter at ihppod. I hope you'll subscribe and share the podcast as we bring you stories about politics and music close to you and your home. Congratulations, Finster. See you next time. I hope there's a good song on when I die Something with a melody that I can softly sigh A minuet, a rhapsody, a sweet lullaby I hope there's a good song on when I die I hope there's a good song on when I pass Through the gates of heaven with a big brass band Trumpets, horns, and tubas I'll go out with a blast I hope there's a good song when my friend the reaper in the evening comes to take me home I walk beside him and sing all the songs I got to know That I had learned while on this earth and he is sure to grow